You know, it's Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Of course, 12th chapter in this book. And uh, written by a fellow named Solomon. He was a pretty wise fellow. Starts right out, talks about him being a preacher, or some seem to think maybe in a sense a philosopher, but uh, <clears throat> I took introduction to philosophy years ago, and if I remember right, they said that means the love of wisdom. But uh, but like I say, we're going to look at uh, Ecclesiastes, and somebody wants a title for the message. Edward usually asks me for a title to put on the internet, and if you want a title, I'll put "Chasing the Wind." Think you're going to ever catch it? Mm -hmm. Uh huh? Well, it's hard to even know which way it's going. Does it change back and forth? Oh, yeah. Of course, there's different winds, you know. The Holy Spirit's wind, through Ock, Panuma, air, you know. That's what the, if you go into the original languages, that's what they'll tell you. And, uh, but Solomon wrote three books in, uh, that are in the, got into the Bible, three different books. And uh, he wrote one when he was a young fella in love, and it's a book about romance. Anybody know what that one is? Song of Solomon. And uh, of course, I guess he'd know something about romance. What, they have 700 wives and 300 concubines? I have no trouble with one wife. <laughs> and uh, 700 wives. Oh, that well, that's what the Bible teaches, though, so I believe it. I believe but it. those wives got him in a lot of trouble because a lot of them worshiped idols, and next thing you know, he's worshiping idols. Right. So you got to be careful about some things, you know. And some ways he was really wise, and some ways he wasn't so wise. So. He wrote the book of Song of Solomon, and that was a romance, and I think it shows how we're the bride of Christ and Jesus is the bridegroom. If you study the book, you'll come up with some things about that. And he wrote another book of, uh, when he was uh, at the peak or the zenith of his uh, intellectual power, and his kingdom was really, he was kind of like the young people today, kind of had everything handed to him. Young people in America pretty well, parents, mom and dad, pretty well give them everything. And then they grow up thinking somebody owes it to them. So I don't need to work, somebody will just give it to me. But uh, that's not really the way life works. But he wrote this book and it was uh, really somebody says, what do you mean by it was just handed to him? Well, his father was a fellow named David. David fought all the battles. David collected all the material to build the temple. But David couldn't build the temple because the Bible said that he was, his hands had blood on them. And so the Lord used Solomon to actually take all the material and everything that... Plus, he walked into the kingdom and was peaceful. And uh, he was rich. Super rich. Uh, he, he had so much, he, he, he could just pretty well do anything he wanted. But that got him in trouble. You know, sometimes it's best to maybe have to wait for some things. And so he wrote uh, Song of Solomon, then he wrote the uh, next uh, book of Proverbs. 31 chapters. That's his wisdom book. And then he wrote the third book, and this is Ecclesiastes, and this is the foolish book. Because he, he's telling you what it would be like seeing things the way mankind sees them, down under the sun, and there's a bunch of words, and he keeps talking about vanity, vanity, and 
Uh, is life worth, worth living? Well, it's not if all you're uh, trying to do is please yourself and don't care about other people, then I don't believe it's worth living. But if you put let God have some control in your life, it'll be worth living. Amen. But if you're selfish and just want everything the way you want it, then I don't think so. But if you go to Psalms, and I'm not wanting you to turn to these necessarily, I'm just going to tell you what's here. You can look them up, uh, you can write them down and look them up if you want to. But uh, kind of at the beginning of his, uh, when he became king, the uh, Lord told him he'd give him anything he wanted. You, you pick. Now what if God told you that? And uh, God was pretty pleased with him. Psalms 39, verses five, 4 and 5. As a matter of fact, let's look at it. Amen. Uh, Psalms uh, 39. We'll take the time to look at it. And God was pleased with his choice here. He started out on a good foot, but he got sidetracked. Now it's good to... It started good, but we need to stay on the trail and not get off in a ditch. But, uh, well, so I, first, no, I don't want you to look at Psalms. Well, we're going to read Psalms. Here's, here's where he got his text for the sermon. Psalms 39, then I want you to go to verses 4, uh, 4 and 5. Psalms 39, verses 4 and 5. And this is kind of the text for the sermon on a, the book of Ecclesiastes. And uh, he says, Lord, make me to know mine end and measure my days, uh, what, it, what it is that I may know how uh, frail I am. Are we frail? Mm -hmm. Well, we don't think so. We think, boy, I just, especially when we're young. As we get older, we find out we're more frail than we thought. Kind of comes up, catches up to us, doesn't it? And uh, so then in verse 5, Behold, thou hast made my days as a hand breath, and mine age is nothing, nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Selah. He says, that's the way it is. Pay attention to it. When he says Selah, that's kind of what it means there. But he's, uh, his life, your life's short. Isn't it short? Hand's breath. It's not very wide, not very long. And he says, Behold, uh, thou hast made my days as a hand's breath and my ages as nothing. <laughs> well, how old's God? He's eternal. <clears throat> he's eternal. Before thee, verily, every man at his best <coughs> is altogether vanity, Selah. And so then, I, I wanted to talk a little bit more about all this, but in Proverbs, uh, I think this is a text for a sermon that uh, he preaches in the book of Proverbs. Go to Proverbs chapter 1, and look at the first verse or two here. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, I mean, not Proverbs. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. The word of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. So that kind of tells you what I've already told you, right? Who was his dad? King David. And uh, uh, King David pretty well set up everything for him. Of course, I think God will. He was behind it all, don't you? Amen. And then in verse 2, Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, Vanity uh, of vanity, all is Vanity. Does that sound like... I think he's a little down and depressed there. Yeah. Life's a waste. Well, you ever felt that way? No, you ever got discouraged? Yeah. Well, hopefully if you do, you get up yeah. and go on. Yeah. But he says, uh, verse 3, What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? Now see, he's saying under... As, if we just look around, things just go on and on and on. We'll die off. Somebody else come along. Isn't that the way it works? Mm -hmm. We're just kind of monotonous in a way. There's not much to it. Or is there? Well, if we leave God out of it, there's not much to it. Matter of fact, one of these days you're going to die and you'll end up in a bad place. But if we put God into it, we'll end up in a good place. 
and we're going to go on forever one way or the other. But at the beginning of his uh, ministry, our kingship here, God lets him have uh, pick what he wants wants. And so, uh, 1 Kings chapter 3, let's go there. 1 Kings chapter 3. First Kings chapter three, God allows him to a choice here. And let's go down to uh, verse number uh, six. First Kings chapter three, verse six. But it came to pass when Ahab was no, I'm in the wrong kings. I'm in second kings. Boy, I'm way off. Now, I'll try to get it right this time. First Kings chapter uh, 3. And then we're going to go down to the 6th verse. Well, let's do with five, go to 5. And Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall I give thee? What well, if God come to you and says, What do you want me to give you? Well, I, I said, Well, I'd like to win the lottery and get that million dollars. Huh? He didn't say that, though. <laughs> Verse 6. And Solomon said, Thou hast shown unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he hath he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness. Now he's talking about how his dad, his dad lived for the Lord. Amen. Now he did get messed up with Bathsheba, but he got straightened back out. He repented. And the Lord also could have taken his life over committing adultery, but he didn't. God uh, uh, gave him three choices of punishments. And he said, I'd rather be in God's hands than in man's hands. And uh, uh, so David was, was pretty wise in that sense. I, I think we can trust the Lord more than we can trust man. You don't believe me? Look at what's happening in America today. And so I'm reading on the last part of verse 6 here. According as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in upright rightness of heart with thee, and thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. In other words, he's going to take over the throne of David, his dad's throne. Now verse 7, And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a, a little child. I know not how to go uh, out or to come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore my, thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people. What's he wanting? I want wisdom to judge the people. He said, I got a big job ahead of me, God. I need your help. And now what he's saying? Mm -hmm. now, I don't know if that's King James. That's my translation, <laughs> I guess that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this, thy so great a people? And, he, and, he, and the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast thou asked riches for thyself, nor has hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to uh, according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee wise and uh, a wise and understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any rise like unto thee, and I also have given thee that which thou hast not asked for, both riches and honor. So God gave him even more than he asked for because he was pleased with what he asked for. But as we look at some, think of some of these things he's saying here, 
Uh, I think here his heart's all right with God. Amen. But it won't stay right with God. He'll get out of the will of God. When you get into the book of Ecclesiastes, he gets out of the will of God. In Proverbs, he's in the will of God. He's uh, not foolish. He's given wisdom there. But then when he gets to Ecclesiastes, that's more in the end part of his life, then he starts getting away from God, going into idolatry, and God has to judge him. And then in, in uh, 1 Kings uh, chapter 11, verses 3 to 13, God says, I'm going to take the kingdom away from you because you've gotten away from me. You can't sin and get away. Uh, what is it? Uh, Galatians 6, 7, Be not deceived. God is not more for whatsoever man soweth that shall he also reap. Be sure your sins will find you out. And so he went off into idolatry away from God. And God started to, had to deal with it. And I'll tell you what, if we get away from God, God might have to deal with us. He might and won't, might have to, He will. And somebody says, well, I can't lose my salvation. No, but God can sure discipline you. God, uh, my dad used to say, you can't make anybody do anything, but you might make, you, make them wish they had. Amen. Uh-huh. Can God have ways of working on us and uh, try to get us straightened back out? Sometimes we straighten out, sometimes we don't. Solomon, uh, here in Ecclesiastes, doesn't get very straightened out. But he does kind of come down to the end. We'll get down to that here in a minute. But like I say, he wrote three books. He wrote Song of Solomon. He wrote Proverbs. And then he writes Ecclesiastes. And he preaches a sermon out of that where I read the first verses there. Uh, the word of the preacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem, vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit hath a man of all his labors which he hath, uh, taketh under the sun? And so he's going downhill here. He's getting away from God. Of course, he goes into idolatry and uh, had all those wives. And of course, I guess he got married to a lot of them. Uh, but the question is, is life worth living? Well, if you're just living for self and gratification and things like that, no. Uh, now, the sermon, if you, he preaches here in the book of Ecclesiastes, I'll give you three points. And the first point uh, he states the problem and uh, argues uh, for the negative. He states the problem. Life's not worth living under the sun. If you get to look at it, you're going to get depressed. You know, if you sit around and think about your problems all the time, you'll get depressed. Right. Maybe I ought to ask God to help you instead. Uh, my, you know what my dad would always ask my mother when she started getting depressed? He said, have you prayed about it? Well, that might be kind of irritating to you, but have you? Uh-huh. Have you prayed about it? Have you asked God to help you? Are you trying to get back right with God and get things straightened out? So in chapters 1 and 2, that's the first point. He states the problem and he argues from the negative side, talks about how awful a life is. And it is if you're just living for self and pleasure and, and uh, things like that. But then the second point is, then he, he uh, examines the problem from different angles from chapters 3 to chapters 10 he's arguing the problem from different angles uh, he tries a, a philosophy intellect he tries science he, he, he tries uh, pleasure all these different things guess what he always comes back to the same thing it's not worth it Amen. it's not going to work out very well and he uh, concludes life is worth uh, living if you put God first and a boy, bang, that's the third point. He finally comes to the conclusion that if you'll obey God and put God first, then things will turn out better. Uh, they'll turn out a whole lot better, won't they? But we have to put God first and not ourselves. Proverbs is the wisdom of Solomon. Ecclesiastes is the foolishness of Solomon. You think that's odd. How can he be real wise and real foolish? 
Uh, what was one of the best, the most better known things where it proved how wise he was? Remember the two mothers coming? Right. And they had a little baby and the mo one mother rolled over on the baby and killed her baby. And she was trying to claim the other woman's baby. So they came, go to King Solomon and the, uh, King Solomon uh, hears the story and they're both trying to claim this baby. One's the real mother and one's not. So what Solomon does, he says, well, I'll tell you what, I'll just cut it in half and give you each half. Well, then the real mother steps up and says, no, no, no. Well, then he knew who the real mother was. Because she was the one that cared about the baby. The other mother didn't. And so I think that took some wisdom to come up with a plan like that to figure it out, don't you? That's a pretty good lie detector, wasn't it? Well, and uh, nowadays I guess they want everybody to have a hate detector. I, I think those laws are crazy. If you break a law, you break a law and don't change it and go into whether it's a hate crime or not a hate crime. Doesn't matter whether it's a hate crime or not a hate crime. Throw them in jail or execute them or whatever the law says. It's a crime. Then you won't have to worry about it. If it is a crime, it's a crime. And so now, though, uh, we'll plea bargain and we'll do this and we'll do that. No, I'll just they ought to enforce the laws and quit doing some of these things they're doing. But he's a philosopher, a preacher in a sense, a, a favorite book. This really, Ecclesiastes is a favorite book of cults and atheists because they pull things out of here because he's describing what it's like just living in this world without God. And then they take that and try to base their cultic ideas and not believing in God uh, on those. And you know, there's been millions of people try this Live without God. Can you really live without God? Can't even live period. Well, if God didn't give you your life, you wouldn't even be here. Right. But so, no, it's kind of hard to live without God, but aren't people trying to do it? Oh, I don't need God. I got money in the bank. Well, that's kind of the way Solomon was. I'm rich. I'm famous. I've got power. I hate to say it, some of our politicians are doing that right now in America. Somebody, and uh, I'm not trying to say sides or anything here, but it's uh, kind of crazy to try to live without God. You're living in His world, breathing His air, and He's going to have the final say so whether you like it or not. Amen. Isn't that right or not? Solomon had a, a God given wisdom. Did God give him the wisdom to, do, to rule his country? came from God, didn't it? Through this dream. And he tried every field of endeavor uh, to find pleasure and satisfaction. You know, there's a lot of people, all they live for is right here, right now, today. Whatever, if it's fun, I'm going to do it. If it's not fun, I'm not going to do it. Isn't that what it amounts to? Isn't that our society today? Got to have fun. Got to enjoy it. I, I think that's become our... You want to talk about idols? That's our idols. Right. How many TV channels are there? I can remember when there was only three or four. I don't know how we ever made it. And TV went off about midnight. And this big thing would come up on the screen and they'd play the Pledge of Allegiance. And Anybody remember that? Nancy said, you're dating yourself. Casey can't remember that, can you? Yeah. How many can remember that? <laughs> the older ones can remember it. The younger people can. Now, really, there's. It just really drives me crazy. You go to you go to the drugstore and you want some cough medicine. They got 50 different kinds of cough medicine. This does this and this does this and. Used to be you went down there and they had one or two bottles and that was it. Used to be you went to one doctor and he treated everything. Okay. Now, now you gotta, of course, you know they gotta make some money on it. So the more specialists you go to, the more it costs you. Yeah. Isn't that true? We can go to our family doctor, we don't even have a copay. But if we go to a specialist, but our family doctor always sending us to specialist. 
And as you get older, you'll get tired of going to doctors, I guarantee you. But there's a lot of people that are just endeavoring for fun, pleasure, satisfaction in life without God. We don't need God. I, I don't give God any credit for anything. I don't need God's help. But then when they get in trouble, then they'll go over yelling, God help me. Well, I don't believe in God, but then when they get in trouble, they pray. Well, they're praying to somebody that doesn't exist. Well, that's kind of an atheistic thing, isn't it? And Ecclesiastes, we learn you can not be satisfied without Christ. You can't be satisfied. Vanity is used 37 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. It's just vanity. All vanity. And like I say, we already talked about Proverbs is a wisdom book. Ecclesiastes is the book of foolish things. And uh, I gave you the basic outline. But you know, really, I wanted to get down to this. Uh, skip off. We're not going to go through all the different science and things, that, how he examined everything, try to figure this out. He had the money, the time, and was able to check all these things. Mm -hmm. Most of us probably wouldn't. Most of you have to go to work every day. So that doesn't leave much time. And the time you go to work every day and right. take care of your family, and you don't have too much left over time, but Solomon did. Now, if you get old and retire, then you can do that, right? <laughs> Does it work that way when you get older? Or you still got things you have to do? Well, we still have to do some things, don't we? The dishes. <laughs> well, I said Wednesday night, Nancy, you weren't here. I said, Carol and I used to have a, a dishwasher and a dish dryer. But then, and also we had somebody cut the grass for us, but they grew up and left. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> uh, Martin and Brian, see, we, we had them. They... They could do those things, but they grew up and moved out, and now we're kind of on our own. But we, the conclusion of the whole matter is go to Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and 12. Amen. Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and 12. And Solomon studied all this stuff out. He comes up to this, and he says, now here's the conclusion of the whole matter. And uh, kind of sums it up. But you know, I think what it comes down to is if you're going to put God in the right place or not. Amen. doesn't have to do with how much money you have and, and a lot of these other things that people think are so important. Uh, I think we need to obey God. If you go down to the uh, 12th uh, chapter, the last two verses it says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. One of these days we'll stand before God. That's right. But right now, oh, I don't need God. But you will. You'll be sorry. And you'll be sorry that you didn't. And you know, uh, I... I gave you the title. My message was, uh, what did I say it was? What was the title of my Chasing message? Chasing the wind. Chasing the wind. Chasing the wind. Chasing the wind. Well, can you see the wind? No. You can hear it. You can feel it. You can feel it and you can see it do things. Does it ever do anything? Yes. Well, it could do, do good things and bad things. Well, when a big storm comes in, it can just tear all kinds of things up, can't it? But Edward and I were out walking around at Farmer's Market yesterday. It was a nice little breeze. Didn't it feel good, Edward? Yeah. Yeah. Can be good, can it? Can be bad. Another thing, you ever watch a bird fly when it's real breezy? It just sticks its wings out and... Doesn't even have to flap and work. Huh? Will the wind hold them up? Keep them from... Matter of fact, and you, you say, why? Well, I'm not a bird. You ever got been in an airplane? Mm -hmm. And it goes off down the runway and just lifts off? Mm -hmm. 
Now how in the world can the wind hold something up that heavy? Huh? Well, they got to build the wings just right and have something to move it, but it works, doesn't it? So the wind could be used for good, the wind could be used for bad. <clears throat> but some people, it's blowing them in the, they're letting it blow them in the wrong direction. We need to get blown in the right direction. Amen. If we're getting blown away from God, that's the wrong direction. If we're getting blown toward God, that'd be the right direction, right? Now go to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, St. John. Matter of fact, in Hosea chapter 8, verse 7 says, Sow to the wind, reap a whirlwind. If we sow to the wind of the world, we're going to be in a storm. Right. But if we'll sow to the wind of God, the Holy Spirit will hold us up. Is the Holy Spirit holding you up this morning? Amen. Do you need God's help? Have you ever tried living life without God? Go, oh, I don't need you, God. Well, it won't be long till you'll find out you do need him. Amen. Isn't that the way it works? Matter of fact, I had a funeral. Two little twin boys. And one guy hit by a car and drug down the street, ripped the back of his head off. How old were they? Three and a half years old. Have them right over here by the school. Every time I go by that intersection, I think about it. I preach that funeral. And at the time, the dad was an engineer. The mother was a nurse, an RN. And he told me, he says, they meet, the family might need God, I don't need him. Well, first place, this couple wanted to have a baby and they weren't be, being able to have a baby and the church started praying. Well, then they had twins. And that's the way the story worked. Then one of them got killed in the middle of a big storm. I liked to never got down to the hospital the time I got down to Methodist. The dad sitting there with the blood all over his shirt where he'd been holding the baby that got killed. Well, three years old. Get, to me, that's kind of a baby. But it's a pretty sad story. But then a few years ago, you know, after that, they had some other children, didn't they, Carol? Matter of fact, I think they're in college now. Okay? And uh, they're doing pretty good. And I saw the dad, and guess what? Dad decided that he does need God. And that God has blessed him. And God gave them children after that child that they lost. Isn't that a good story or not? Yeah. I'm glad God was able, through the Holy Spirit, to work on him and change him. And God can do things like that. Now we're looking at the Gospel of John, chapter 3 is where I told you to go, right? There's this religious leader here, and he's named Nicodemus. And he comes to Jesus, and he talks to Jesus, and... He doesn't really understand all this about being saved and born again. And uh, Jesus has to explain it to him. Like I say, he's a religious leader. Isn't that something that a preacher wouldn't necessarily understand things about God? You know, there's some preachers that aren't saved. Right. There's some preachers who don't even believe there's a hell. Mm -hmm. I've known some people left churches because they found out the preacher didn't believe there was a hell. Well, most people believe there's a heaven, but a lot of people don't believe there's a hell. I've done surveys and found that out. Yep, I agree. But we're looking at John chapter 3 now, and we're going to go down here to the 8th verse. John chapter 3 and verse 8. Can't mess this one up too bad. There's only one St. John, not three, two or three. And... Uh, Verse 8, he says, he's talking to them, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof. Can you hear the wind? Well, I was looking at that word listeth. What's that mean? 
It goes wherever it wants to go. Doesn't it? Well, you could stick your hand up there and stop it. I can't, but Jesus could. Did Jesus do that? Wasn't he in the boat and they were about to sink and he said, peace, be still, and just calm down. But I can't do that. Man can't do that. You think sometimes we get in storms and we need God's help? You ever been in a storm and you needed God's help? Amen. If you haven't, you will probably get in one. I was I saw a picture, it's pretty neat at the commons yesterday. We were out there walking around and, and it was showing Jesus' feet. It just showed his feet and ankles and the bottom of his robe. And he's walking on water. He's just showing his feet walking on. I thought, man, that was a neat picture. Jesus could do it though, couldn't he? Mm -hmm. Well, I can't walk on water. I can't if it's frozen. Mm -hmm. But then I got to be careful because if it's too thin, I'll fall in. Mm -hmm. Isn't that true? Mm -hmm. But Jesus could walk on water. And Peter walked on water until he got to looking at the storms and the winds and what was going on. Did he start to sink? Got to be careful about those winds. We got to get the right winds. We need the Holy Spirit, not the winds of the world. And what the world's putting out. Verse 8, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst te not tell whence it cometh, and whether it goeth. So it is every one that is born of the Spirit. Did the wind come and save you? Did the Holy Spirit come and work on you and convince you? that Jesus was God, that He died on the cross and He was buried and He rose from the dead. And if you put your trust in Him, you can go to heaven. And that, of course, you read it in the Bible, but the Holy Spirit had to make the Bible real to your heart. Just because you read the words doesn't mean you believe them. But can the Holy Spirit work on you and get you to believe them? And sometimes you maybe didn't believe them the first time you read them or heard them. But then... The Lord sent the wind to buy again. <laughs> did the wind come by until finally? Did you finally get it? Did it finally lift you up? Huh? I think that's pretty good myself. There's different kinds of wind here. He says, read in verse 8, Everyone that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and saith unto him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel? Knowest not these things? Verily, verily I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not uh, our witness. If I had told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? So then he goes on, he explains about the new birth, and and uh, uh, how he could be saved. And Nicodemus, I believe, got saved. Was Nicodemus one of those fellows that took Jesus off the cross? Yes, he was. Joseph. And he was a religious leader. But you know, I want you to go to Galatians chapter 5 now. Galatians chapter 5. That's yeah, not as bad as I thought. Time-wise, I mean. Galatians chapter 5 I want you to see some things here we need to go down here to Galatians chapter 5 and uh, it shows you the uh, winds of the flesh and then winds of uh, the Holy Spirit here and it really compares these two things how do you know whether it's God moving you or the world moving you? How can you tell? Well, let's look now at Galatians chapter 5, verse uh, 16. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Is the Spirit leading you or not? Can you tell whether the Spirit's leading you? Well, if you're going the right way, I believe the Spirit's leading you. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, 
and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would you ever want to go to church and the flesh doesn't want to but the spirit wants to then you have to decide which way you're going to go don't you which one you're going to let carry you and uh, he says but if you be led of the spirit ye are not under the law now the works of the flesh are manifest which are these adultery fornication uncleanness lasciviousness adultery witchcraft and he goes heresies envies murders and all these he lists all these things down through here i think solomon had fallen into a bunch of these lasciviousness lustfulness how many wives did he have was he well, did he want power and money and prestige? And well, what wind was moving him? It was moving him away from God, wasn't it? But now, how do you know if you're getting moved toward God? And he gives us the answers right here with this. Go down to verse 22. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Well, if you're going in that direction, do you have peace? Do you have joy? Long-suffering? You know, sometimes that's kind of hard to have long-suffering, isn't it? Gentleness? You know, sometimes somebody does something to you, it's hard to control yourself not wanting to get back at them you ever have any trouble with that but if you have trust that in that God helping you to have that he says meekness temperance against such there is no law and they that are Christ uh, have crucified the flesh with affections and lust if we live in the spirit let us also walk in the spirit let us not be desirous of vain glory provoking one another ending one another so in other words, we need to let the God's Spirit, the wind, move us in the right direction toward God instead of away from God. And then I wanted to give you one last verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. I think Solomon needed to end up with this verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the word of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. But the Spirit's going to try to blow me away from God. The Holy Spirit's going to try to take me toward God. And I have to choose which way do I want to go. Am I going to walk in the Spirit of God or am I going to walk in the Spirit of the world? Do we have a choice? But we have God to help us go the right way. We need to make that decision. And you know, as you get older, I'm going to tell you, as you get older, I don't know how old you are. I know some are older, some are younger. We got more older ones here than younger ones. You know how old I am. Isn't that true? But I wanted to read some. Vanity of vanity, saith this preacher, all is vanity, Ecclesiastes 12.8. Young man's life is empty if you're uh, just living for the here and now. Are there some people just living for the here and now? Yeah. Is there more to it than just here and now? Yeah. One day you will find that you have in your hand is a fistful of air. You don't have anything. If you're just living for self and the world, right. one day you'll come to that. When I was a child, I laughed and wept. Time crept. When I, as a youth, I dreamed and wa talked. Time walked. When I became a full-grown man, time ran. Then, when the older, older still, uh, I daily grew. Time flew. Soon I shall find and traveling on time gone. Time's running out. You need to choose which way you're going to let the wind blow you. Toward God or away from God. You have a choice. 
you have a choice. Psalmist writes, uh, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Psalms chapter 90 and verse 12. Amen. You only have so many days, what are you going to do with it? Solomon started out good, didn't he? Got wisdom from God, started living for God, but then he started going in the wrong direction. But I'm glad at the end, he said the conclusion is the whole matter is to live for God. We need to live for God. That would be Ecclesiastes, the last chapter, the last two verses you read that. Amen. Let's all stand.